Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I truly hope you're safe and sound. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And welcome back to a new season of Carnegie Connects, a series of conversations about issues of critical importance to Americans and to the world. Today, I'm truly pleased to welcome to the program Darren Massico and Michael Kaufman for a discussion of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, implications for U.S. policy. Uh, to Dara, a special welcome. Uh, Dara will officially, formally, and in every other way, uh, join Carnegie uh, early next week, I believe, as a senior fellow in the Russia and Eurasia program. Uh, her work is going to focus on defense and security issues in Russia and Eurasia. Prior to joining Carnegie, uh, Dara was a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and a senior analyst for Russian military capabilities at the Department of Defense. She's published extensively on Russian military capabilities and modernization as a preeminent expert. On that, I am absolutely certain on the uh, <clears throat> Russian-Ukrainian war. She was a master's degree in national security and strategic studies from the U.S. Naval War College, a BA in Russian language and literature uh, from the University of North Carolina in Chippewa. And I want to welcome back to the program Mike Kaufman. Uh, Mike really needs no introduction, but I'm going to uh, give him one anyway. He's a senior fellow in, in the Russia and Eurasia program at Carnegie, where he focuses on the Russian military and Eurasian security issues. Prior to joining Carnegie <clears throat> in 2023, he served as the director of the Russian Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analyses, where he conducted research on the capability, strategy, and military thought of the Russian armed forces. Aside from his work at Carnegie, uh, Mike is also a principal research scientist at CNA, Center for Naval Analysis, and adjunct center, senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. Contributing at our war on the rocks, perhaps many of you have heard him there and seen what he's written, where he wrote, hosts the Russia Contingency, a bi-weekly podcast on the Russian military and war against Ukraine. Um, he previously served, among other places, at the Woodrow Wilson Center, Years ago, Mike, where I had the privilege and honor of, um, of getting to know Mike. So we have a lot, a lot to unpack. So let's get started. Permit me one, uh, I, I guess, observation. Most conflicts since the end of the Second World War tended to involve consurgency campaigns and proxy wars, making a large-scale invasion, as we witnessed in Russia and Ukraine, pretty rare. And analyzing data compiled by the Uppsala Conflict Data Program on conflict termination. Since 1946, they found that when interstate wars, and this is an interstate war, last longer than a year, uh, they extend to over a decade on average in one form or another. Now, maybe the past won't be prologue here. I certainly hope that turns out to be true. But history and current realities at least suggest that we're in for a, a little longer ride. Neither Russia nor Ukraine has any interest in seeing this war end right now in these circumstances. There's nothing to suggest that either capacity to wage war has been significantly diminished. And, and I think both uh, Dara and Mike will agree, um, there's very little prospect right now that diplomacy could lead to an acceptable settlement, even a temporary one. All of which to say is there's tremendous focus on the battlefield. Not just the will to fight and resourcing and how to manage reserves, but on the critical corollary of the will to fund will to fight and the will to fund. So let me just start um, by getting both of you, Michael beginning with you, to offer, if you could, the 40,000 foot view, not necessarily all granular, but the 40,000 foot view on where we've come since June 4, I believe, when the Ukrainian counteroffensive began. Mark, let me start with you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Aaron. So I think we've seen uh, over the past several months that principally played out along three axes of events, with one main one in the south from Arihiv towards Neotopol and, and kind of two other supporting ones. I think Ukrainian progress has been steady but fitful over the course of several months. Ukraine took principally an attritional approach. It's been a very difficult fight. Uh, if you look at it, you see that the Russian defense was concentrated in the first line. A lot of the defenses were kind of oriented towards the the what was perceived to be the initial line defense. That's where Russians concentrated. 
and they tried to stymie the Ukrainian advance. So momentum was very slow in the first three months because the heaviest defended line was actually the first line the Ukrainians really had to get through, if that makes sense. Okay. Where we are in recent weeks is that the, the attrition suffered by Russian forces, the advantages that the Ukrainian military had been able to establish had begun to show some success. There was a change in the dynamic and you saw an increase in the momentum. Ukrainian forces broke through and the first line of defense uh, along the main axis in the south. And they've breached the second line of defense are now kind of expanding the salient, hoping to eventually make it make it turn it into a breakthrough, right? That said, there's a lot we can't see. Uh, the state of the actual uh, forces on either side, what their combat effectiveness is, how much force ability they have in reserve, that's a primary driving factor. The second one's a question of artillery ammunition. On the Russian side, they've been conserving and trying to adapt to, to uh, an approach that conserves the use of artillery ammunition. On the Ukrainian side, it's heavily dependent on what the United States provide. That's why the decision to provide the Pigum cluster ammunition was so crucial over the course of the summer. It extended the timeline for this offensive, which might have culminated early without the actual munitions to keep it going, and to make the Ukraine approach effective, which was very, uh, very artillery or artillery intensive. All right. Where we are now is that those are going to be the primary factors that determine the force of this offensive. I hate to say it, but we are sort of in the decisive phase. Much, much is going to be determined in the next couple of weeks. And any couple of any weeks in the offensive are, are decisive. That's true. But looking from the opening breaching attempt, the initial assault in June, kind of the arc of this operation, where we are now is probably the more significant phase. It's coming down to who has more reserves, who's better able to manage their combat power. Who is the resolve and the perseverance? I think clearly that favors Ukrainian military. But the Russian military also has strategic reserves that they've deployed into the fight as well. You know, and then and then secondary factors which come up again and again are things more like weather, although I think people tend to fixate on them. I don't think they're nearly as important uh, compared to the primary ones. So that's, I think, a fair depiction of where we are. And I think a fair amount is going to be decided in, in the coming weeks. Well, that's fascinating. So uh, I think uh, <clears throat> um, Chairman Milley, uh, in an interview uh, a day or so ago, talked about the war lasting, or at least this phase of the counteroffensive, lasting another 45 days, depending on the weather. I don't want to reduce this to a bumper sticker, but um, if you are we somewhere between breach and breakthrough? Which is a formulation that appeared, I think, in, in one of the podcasts or or one of the pieces that you wrote, or is that simply too simplistic? Are we somewhere in between, and could we see a dynamic change in the next month and a half? So it would have to change for it to become a breakthrough, right? The, the, I think the hope is that the Ukrainian military is steadily pressing the Russian forces back into prepared lines, could eventually have a real breakout, and that would allow them to make significant gains and then impose a, a real dilemma on, on the Russian forces trying to defend right? Attrition has worked for Ukraine forces in the past, but those were other contexts. I'm not saying it's going to work here, right? Each battle is its own fight. It's taking place in, in its own uh, geography with its own correlation of forces. I also wouldn't be overly deterministic. That is, I wouldn't put a number on it and say it's going to be 30 days or 45 days or that the weather is the primary thing that's going to constrain it. But yeah. it is fair to say that we are very much in the latter stages of this offensive, right? I also, I also don't hold the view that some have put out there that one, it's still too soon to tell or that this offensive can just go on for many months into the winter and it has no real discernible ending point. It will. And I think we are in the latter phases of it and we have to be clear right about that as well. Thanks. Uh, Derek, you, you, you know, you use the, the conceit of four phases, uh, which I found fascinating. Could you just briefly, if you maybe plan on talking about it anyway, Briefly summarize um, those, and we're, oh, we are now in the fourth phase, but uh, over to you. Sure, and thanks so much for, for having me, and, and thank you for the, the welcome to Carnegie Connects. Uh, yes, so there have been four main phases so far to this war, the first one being the Russian invasion that culminated um, early spring last year, and there was a consolidation, which is second phase, um, to eastern Ukraine. Then you had the collapse of the Kharkiv front and uh, mobilization, and I view that as the third phase, which essentially lasted them through um, early winter when they attempted a counteroffensive, 
And I think the fourth phase we can start in June of this year, which is the Ukrainian counteroffensive. So we are now um, you know, three months, three months into this. And I would say um, another factor, if we're talking about you know time and, and what factors are really um, determinative here, I would say that the remaining ammunition left on the Ukrainian side is really important. That is not a number that is publicly available. Um, I assume that there are people who know that in Ukraine um, and potentially here as well. If the Ukrainians have burned through a lot of the ammunition that they had that was supposed to get them to some final objective, be it severing the land grid or isolating Crimea or whatever the objective is, um, if they've burned through most of that, that is going to tell us when this offensive will start to slow down. Um, I don't have that burn rate in front of me. I, I can't speak to it. Um, if a lot of it's still in reserve, this can go on. I don't. I agree with Mike. I don't think it's necessarily weather dependent, uh, but I I do think that that's a, a really important factor, and it's really hard to speculate on it with a lack of information. Right. So it's not a stalemate, uh, and it's not a breakthrough. Could you briefly sum up what your sense of what it actually is in terms of the progress made? Right. So, um, you know, we have seen the Ukrainians adapt um, early on when this started. There was an armored assault push, and we've all seen the videos that the Russians have put out about certain types of armored vehicles getting destroyed, mine clearing equipment in particular. They have um, been forced to switch to a more dismounted approach. Um, but this, these are, um, this is really painstaking work. Um, for people who are not familiar, we're talking about advancing through some of the thickest, most complex minefields that we've seen in decades while being shelled with artillery, uh, while having to watch out for drones, while your own communications are being jammed by the Russians, and you're also doing it in um, you know, waist high or knee high grass. Um, oh, and by the way, the Russians can remine things remotely. So this is a this is a very slow, um, intense process that brings people sort of to the limit psychologically, just with all of those those factors. Um, but they have adapted and they are moving forward. They have committed a lot of their forces, particularly down south, to try to get to that breakthrough. Now they've, I think, um, liberated about 35 square kilometers um, this month. Um, every kilometer counts, but I would probably say that, you know, I, I have seen um, where, you know, we focus in on this breakthrough and this pushing forward near Robitaille um, down in the south. But if you, if you zoom back and you look at the front, there hasn't been a lot of changes in the way in the last three months. So that's, that's where we are. Um, I, I do not believe that they're they're out of steam, um, but you know, like I say, I, I don't have the. I'm not counting the stockpiles right now. I, I don't have that information. Right, um, Mike. To you, uh, there's been an enormous amount of ink spilled in the last several weeks from anonymous sources, which some people have argued is second guessing. Other people talk about, "I told you sewing," and there are others who think this is CYA uh, in. I guess my question to you is. We can skip the why is it happening, unless you want to comment on that. Um, more important, is any of it right? Is any of the anonymous critique about the way the Ukrainians have launched this offensive, uh, using American military standards as the key metric rather than how Ukrainians fight, is that why the expectations have been, there's a gap between what we're watching and the expectations of some in Washington that um, Ukrainians should be a lot farther along than they are? So my sense of it is that a lot of that commentary on the actual execution of the offensive and how Ukrainian forces have performed is off base and it reflects first our weak knowledge of how that force operates, their ability to skill force employment, right? Their, their preferences and, and the tactics they choose to employ. And also the operating environment is the real conditions on that battlefield, what it really looks like and what you can and can't do and what will and will not succeed. That's part of the issue. Yeah. And it's very much born of the problem that we have been, you know, extensively involved to some extent in this war from a material support and intelligence and sustainment perspective, but we are not there, right? In fact, our presence is very limited. And so our touch points, our ability to sense and understand what's really happening with that military, I think is constrained. 
and, and, and I'm happy to tease that out with you uh, if you're interested in the bid. The other criticisms about sort of strategy, I don't know where they come from, but yeah, at a certain point in the fence of you are going to have folks looking at strategy and, and there, there are definitely going to be some could have, should have, what have you. I think maybe the only area where I sense there are, there are fair questions to ask was more on the distribution of not the overall forces Ukraine had between the different parts of the offensives, but where Ukraine's best forces were, which were typically fighting around Bakhmut in the east, and uh, the units that Ukraine gave this job to, to actually prosecute the main offensive in the south, the one with a real strategic objective, and that was the much newer units, and that, that was, you know, principally a risky strategy, and as, as it turned out. But nonetheless, look, I, I also don't like armchair generalship, right? especially by by uh, officers who, one, may not have a lot of experience in this type of war to begin with, given our wars the last 30 years, and two, don't have much experience in Ukraine and haven't been to the front lines. And speaking somebody who has done field work and has been there for some of these main phases that Dara described, I can tell you that the reality of the war is often quite different from the way it's depicted in social media or, or even sometimes in the press. I mean, and Darren, maybe you can weigh in this as well. If if politics and security are the real constraints as to why the United States doesn't have the kind of actual battlefield data and observers on the ground, is that what's driving this? Is it fear of looking over Ukrainian military commanders' shoulders? How come we don't know exactly what's happening? Well, I, I think there probably is a, a pretty good understanding. It's just that those conversations are are not public. I mean, this is a, this is really sensitive right now. It's in the middle of, of this counteroffensive. Um, I, I would say though, um, I thought that it was helpful that General Milley recently um, during a media engagement, he was very frank. He said, "I have never experienced anything like what the Ukrainians are are going through right now on the battlefield, and I've I've been in." you know, all sorts of different combat situations, but never anything like this, never never anything this intense. And I think it's really important for our senior officer to say that because when he said Oh, I'm not sure if you've lost me or not. I've lost both of you. Uh, no, I'm here. I, are you are you still there? You still there? Mike, can you hear me? Yeah, here you are. Let's see where right, we get. Okay, yeah, I think, I think we're all back. back. Yes, back? yeah, I think we're both. Um, sorry about that technical yeah. difficulties. Um, but I think it's really important for when our, our senior officer um, says, you know, I don't have direct experience with this, um, like this. Then it gives permission on down the line um, for everyone else uh, uh, to to say the same and, and have that that moment of humility. Um, and, and really, I think um, the Ukrainians have so much to teach us about this kind of war in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, a good dose of Western and American humility, I think, is in order here. Um, yeah. Yeah, the other tsunami of criticism um, follows the, the following line, and it has to do with the risk aversion, reported risk aversion of the administration. Um, the argument is being made that the Ukrainian counteroffensive can't succeed. Uh, with the pace and the intensity that that it, it might, uh, because Washington has chosen not to provide Ukraine with the right tools. I realize training is another matter, since we didn't begin early enough, and training Ukrainians in combat uh, arms warfare is no easy matter. But is there any truth to this? I mean, it's a powerful argument that's being advanced, particularly in Washington, um, by people who believe we should be much more risk ready when it comes to supplying uh, Ukraine with certain weapon systems. Uh, Mike, to you first. Is that a legitimate criticism? I think it's a legitimate criticism about 2022. I think too much of the conversation focus on particular weapons and that makes it very superficial rather than the the big picture investments that people really have to make, right? Artillery munition production, air defense and air defense munitions, and scaling up training to reconstitute the Ukrainian force and try to generate combat power so they could go on the offensive. 
And those are the areas where, um, you know, in some areas, the U.S. made investments early and Europeans made them late. And in other areas, the U.S. kind of held up the train. And we have to look back and realize that the, the conversation that to me makes at least the most sense that I, I find uh, connects with, with my experience, what I've seen this work, is that for different reasons, whether it's concerns over escalation, whether it's failure to find the political will to make the right investments at the right time, or other, let's say, European allies, many of them did not make critical investments because yeah. they thought that it wouldn't matter by the time they did, not realizing this was going to be a, a long war. At, at uh, a number of of points, there there were moments, there were decision points where these calls have to be made because the lead times to implement things are so long, Aaron, right? If you want to build out nine or 12 brigades for an offensive, you know, you're going to have to get on top of that a lot sooner, start a whole train and equip mission. And and so I think, I think consistently it's been late to need and the preparation for this offensive ended up being kind of a surge effort. And if you ask why did it have to be a surge effort, uh, obviously, some decision points were made, but it's not a solely Western story, too, right? That's the other thing. At the end of the day, it's also very much been Ukraine's war, and the the extent to which the West has supported it has definitely structured Ukrainian choices, right? It's both enabled Ukraine and constrained it, but a number of the key choices in this war have also been been made by Ukrainian leadership themselves, too. It's not a case of, of the United States telling Ukraine. Uh, how to fight this or how to do this. Although I do see some anonymous people trying to do that, you know, through the New York Times and Washington Post. Um, we seem to have lost Arab. So let me begin this question with you, Mike. Um, can you demythologize for us the issue of F-16s? I mean, uh, where, how important are they? Where do they fit? Is there, has there, I mean, again, is it are we too risk averse? Didn't we start early enough? I mean, there's no magic weapon, no Panglossian fix, no single weapon system that's going to change fundamentally alter the course of this war. But there's a lot of mythology on the F-16. So, what do you think? Well, there's a lot of mythology on the Leopard too before the F-16, right? And a lot of mythology about long-range precision strike weapons like uh, Storm Shadows. They've been introduced four months ago. Uh, look, here's the way I look at it first, just to understand the real impact of weapons. They typically have their biggest impact on the battlefield when they are first introduced at scale, right? And they can have a significant impact in an offensive or an operation, but then they generally drive cycles of adaptation and eventually maybe even counter. All right. The F-16 conversation, that's an important conversation, a long-term transition program, right, to get Ukraine uh, this platform which can much better integrate with all sorts of other western capabilities say different types of missiles and and uh and strike systems all right but that's going to take time and there's a lot an air force has to do about itself in order to make this transformation and just acquiring western aircraft fourth generation aircraft and getting pilots trained up first it takes quite a quite a bit of time to make that transition at scale, if that makes any sense, not to get your first F-16 in the sky with eight to 12 pilots, which I'm sure Ukrainians could do uh, right. fairly easily, but to then actually build out the capability to, to employ this part of the Air Force. And that's all gonna take time. All right, what was, the, what was the constraint? I personally think that probably one of the biggest constraints in the US was where to emphasize spending and the money, right? Whether to focus the the money allocated in preparing for this offensive and getting munitions and other things. And at what point to focus on F-16s, at least that's how the Pentagon was sort of pitching it. And that's the only way I can interpret, right? I'm not in, in the administration, so I can't say who it really was, which I think we certainly could have started on the F-16 transition sooner and on giving permission, authorizing F-16s to be transferred by European allies. So bottom line, I think providing F-16s is important. I think it's key to think of this as a capability that Ukrainians will be able to use to some extent next year, but more of a long-term transition program plan of how to build out the Ukrainian military such that it can deter the Russian military and take it on in the coming years. But I also think that folks need to get off of the platform and capability-centric approach the way they think about these things and realize that that's one piece of the puzzle. But some of these other things take longer. One of the challenges we saw in this offensive is that although Western capabilities were transferred, right, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, um, what have you, Ukrainian military can assimilate those quite quickly. 
But if you really give short shrift to the time to build out combat effective units, to build unit cohesion, to train command staffs, it's much harder to operate as a unit than in the field, right? You have the technology, but it takes time to build some of these other things and you can only compress it so much. So it's also about managing expectations, understanding that these things have an impact, but you have to be realistic about the timelines. Yeah. Uh, I think we've lost Dara uh, visually. Uh, Dara, are you there, audio? I am, I'm sorry, I had to turn off my camera so I don't drop out of the call right. again. It's I can wonderful to, to see you, but it's great that we can hear you. So let me let me just ask you quickly on, on uh, the administration West on the West risk aversion here when it comes to not giving Ukraine what they need when they need it in order to be more successful this counter offensive. Is there any truth to this? Um, I, I agree with Mike. I think maybe that early in the war, there might have been some concerns about we don't know where the red lines are, or what the escalatory value of some of these things are. I don't think that's the case 18 months in. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that the war like this, we are building the aircraft as we are flying it. And I think the delays that we see in certain things are not from a deliberate metering of aid. I think it's logistically very complicated. There are a lot of people working very hard on this to supply the levels of um, weapons and systems that we're doing. Um, it, you know, could they supply more? Um, could they do it faster? Probably so. But I think it's important to look at the, the motivation here. I don't think the motivation is to deliberately withhold from them. I think it's, I yeah. think there's some organizational challenge here. Right. Well, we're going to return to the issue of risk aversion uh, at a concern of escalation, but one, just one counterfactual, just humor me here. If in fact Ukrainians had, forget air supremacy, air superiority, if that were, if that were a factor now, would things be different three months in? Um, to you? Uh, yeah. Well, it, it would, but it, it would require them to have suppressed um, the Russian air defense network. And, and it's, it's pretty robust and it, it is layered. Um, you know, I'm not sure necessarily how we would fare. If you talk to some of our, you know, Air National Guard or some of our Air Force units, you know, we, we have this debate all the time. How would we suppress the air defense network? Um, and, and so I, you know, I think it's important to, to manage expectations of how, how difficult that would be. Um, the other challenge is that the Russians are, are dug in in such a way that even if they were able to come in and, and bomb them, um, some of the, we're talking about underground tunnels, we're talking about fortified trench networks, we're talking about, you know, things hidden in tree lines. So again, there's a, there's a limit there in terms of efficacy. Yeah. Right. Is yeah, that, Aaron, I'm very aware of that question because this gets us into the category of wish casting, right? So <laughs> having Western aviation doesn't give you air superiority. That's something you have to achieve. And you also right. you have to maintain once you've achieved it. Yeah. And the only countries that have been proven to be very effective at that are first like the United States, maybe Israeli Air Force, but many Western militaries on their own would struggle to achieve air superiority, certainly against a country with uh, an air defense network like Russia, right? So it's important not to not to um, conflate having uh, fourth generation Western aircraft with the ability to attain and retain air superiority. And the problem with that question is, of course, you can structure anything this way, right? If, what if Ukraine had the magical ability to eliminate all mines in their path on the battlefield, would that make things a lot easier? My answer to that is yes, it most definitely would. But right. why, why is that the consideration we have right now, right? Yeah, and, yeah, it's like saying that if there were no mountains in Switzerland, it would be a different country. I mean, I-, I yeah. Just I'm responding to the critique of many in Washington, probably without a lot of military experience, who somehow suggest that that's that that's on us. And I'm not sure it's fair. It's a it's a fair judgment. Be that as may, I want to get to some fundamental questions about the relationship between the battlefield and strategy and the future. But I want to do a sort of lightning round to ask each of you for very brief comments. Uh, I know that's it's crazy on four issues. Number one, Wagner or Wagner. Um, Mike, irrelevant now, still a force. I was going to say the right answer is Wagner, but okay. 
Um, the uh, my view is that no, it's not irrelevant. They actually the the core of the fighters and most of the commanders uh, are still there and they're likely going to continue operating in some way, shape, or form. It's not clear that Russia can actually supplant them in their operations in Africa and the Middle East. They lost the core business side of the organization, which was Prigozhin, but it's likely going to be a similar taken over, and they might you know they might come back if, uh, under a different name. They've decamped from Ukraine to Belarus as a sort of platform to, to use to operate in these other parts of the world. But it doesn't mean that they won't be back either. Some folks have basically, you know, waved and said, well, they've been eliminated based on the events of the last three months. And the answer is not really not necessarily. Uh, and even if you were to eliminate the organization, look, six to eight, nine thousand fighters, however many they had that's those people's living they're just going to go into other organizations that have been stood up by other parts of the russian state although wagner was kind of distinct in 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 what it was as a parastatal entity so okay. i would still watch the space and i wouldn't assume that that's that's the last we've heard of it uh in in this war uh Dara, to you on the question of corruption and weapons procurement and and management uh obviously it, it, President Zelensky has made some changes in recent weeks. How how relevant and salient is this is this issue now? Forget reconstruction and the future of Ukraine as a democratic polity and what the transnational uh, index on corruption it says that Ukraine is the second most corrupt country in Europe after the after Russia. Is corruption an issue that we should be concerned about now? Um, I, you know, I think it is, and, and I think we have to be you know, really uh, realistic about this. There is a desire um, in Kyiv to make sure that uh, when they are made aware of these kind of issues, that they deal with it promptly. They do not want the perception taking hold that Western resources or Western money is going to be um, frittered away or embezzled. Um, so, you know, yes, they did replace the defense minister, but I think that's actually a sign of health. And, um, you know, it is it is also impossible um, to control everybody at all times. So there are going to be instances of problems in, in any defense industrial complex. It's whether Ukraine has the will and the oversight and the enforcement capacity to address these issues. Um, you know, I'll, I will just point out that on the Russian side, um, you know, this is, they don't uh, want to have a certain percentage of their defense budget frittered away into graft. But when you look at it, um, a lot of generals are living uh, quite large with multiple mansions to include the defense minister. So it's all out in the open there and it never gets addressed. Um, so, you know, as uh, I think Ukraine is, is moving away from that. They are very much a military in transition from this. They are um, not just in the military, but multiple ministries are in transition from that kind of model. So yeah. I think they need support. That, that's my sense, too. Uh, Mike, on uh, North Korean assistance, um, it matters. I guess it's a question of degree. We don't know what we're talking about yet, but uh, <clears throat> how would it matter? Well, it depends on what it is. Sorry, I hate to answer your question. Oh, okay. but, yeah. <laughs> uh, one hinges on the other. So <laughs> it's clear that the number one thing Russia needs from North Korea is artillery ammunition, right? For tube artillery and multiple launch rocket systems. That's the top things that Korea has available for them. And I doubt that Kim Jong-un would have gotten on that train to Moscow unless they already had a deal largely in the making of some kind, right? Yeah. Uh, that is, they'd already principally agreed to something and he was showing up to, to sign it and seal it. And I don't think it's hard to guess what North Korea has to offer Russia. Um, and I think we can only, we can venture a guess as to what resources or other things North Korea needs that, that Russia might offer them. And I think for, for Russia, a lot does hinge on uh, material availability of things like ammunition. They've been buying it from Iran. They've been trying to mobilize uh, their own uh, defense industrial uh, complex, and and you are starting to see some results on their end, although their output is fairly anemic relative to their rate, you know, rate of use of artillery ammunition. And so this year is particularly a tough year for the Russian military. But there's you're slowly starting to see increases on their end. Just you are seeing the investments being made in the United States and other Western countries 
suddenly start to pay off as well, right, in, in ramping up production. I don't know if either of you saw the front page New York Times story today on Russian <clears throat> missile production munitions. I mean, the stats in there are staggering. Uh, Pre-war, Russians could produce 100 tanks a year, now 200. They're doubling the number of artillery shells, a million before the war, now 2 million. Now they're expending, I think they expended 11 million artillery shells since the conflict began, according to the New York Times. Um, it raises the question of Russian resilience. Have we underestimated it? Are we not in touch with the Russian capacity that remains. Dara, do you want that one? Sure. Yeah. No. I. Th you know. I. I think uh, Mike and I both have tried to say. You know. Look. The the Russian defense industrial base is still intact. It's under sanctions. It's under pressure. So is the Russian economy in some ways. But it's still intact and it's still functioning. And Russia has been, for the last year, since mobilization was declared, slowly closing a lot of legal loopholes and slowly bringing the wartime economy online. Um, this is a capacity that they have. Um, sanctions evasion is, is a known problem. Um, you know, just like that article says, you know, once we issued all these sector-specific sanctions and export and import controls, it's not like the Russians said, you got me, I'm going to give up now, I, I quit. They just are, they're going to, fall back on old patterns and come up with more creative ways to create shell companies and try to get this equipment. Um, in terms of, of Russian resilience, I, I do think that, you know, this is an uncomfortable conversation to, to have, but, but we have to have it. Um, yes, Russian, and two things can be true at one time. Um, yes, Russian morale is terrible. Um, their commanders are absent or abusive. Um, morale is low, but also, they are still fighting through appalling conditions. They're still fighting despite that command structure, um, despite insufficient rest and rotation. So, you know, it is a resilience. I don't think it's the resilience uh, in the sense that we think of it as overcoming adversity and becoming stronger, um, but it, it is something that they are, they are doing. There will be a long-term cost of it, and, and I'm happy to unpack that later. Right, I know you're also concerned about our productive capacity. Uh, if this war stretches out um, in the next several years. Um, we're nearing the end of our 45 minutes, sadly. So I want to try to get at three three issues. One is predictive, and I'll save it for last. You'll roll your eyes when I ask you, but you don't have to answer if you don't want. The other two, though, cut to the core, military strategy. Um, is an instrument and a tool to advance political aims or to seek some outcome. I wonder if you could respond to two basic assumptions on which the administration seems to be basing their policy, at least they've said so publicly. The first is that the objective of American support, other than to avoid World War III, which the president had said numerous times, I'll get to that in a minute, is to, and Tori Newling made this clear when I interviewed her, um, is to, quote, tilt the battlefield, unquote, to such a degree to Ukraine's advantage that Vladimir Putin will have no choice, no alternative, or will feel more pressure to respond uh, by coming to the negotiating table. And I'll remind you and our listeners that the President of the United States has said in an op-ed last year that this will end in negotiations. He may have said it must end or it will end, or he hoped it would end in negotiations. Is, the, is that logic, that first assumption, right now, accurate? Mike, to you first. Will Putin come to negotiations as a consequence of what the Ukrainians can achieve on the battlefield? Or, or, in the words of one of our Carnegie colleagues, Gene Rumor, is he going to um, uh, uh, die trying to repress and suppress Ukraine or try until he dies? Is that a, a, a credible assumption, Mike? Okay, so the short answer is no, I don't think so. I think that 
negotiations in any near term or even medium term were probably very unlikely. Most importantly, those hopes should never have been um, never been attached to this offensive. You know, this offensive was highly successful and achieved all of its objectives. The negotiations were then quite quite unlikely as well. Uh, one thing folks have to appreciate that uh, if Ukraine liberates uh, much or all of its territory, which would be, I think, a, a great place to be, we'll call a fantastic problem to have, which could still well continue as a cross-border interstate war. Unfortunately, in wars, it's often up to the loser to decide when the war is over. Right. And there's no evidence the Russian leadership is willing to negotiate. There isn't much evidence that a major defeat would cost such a negotiation. If it did, the last fall's defeats in Kharkiv and Kherson might have led to that, right, Aaron? Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of evidence that the Russian leadership is committed to sustaining this war, that they have a, a principal goal of destroying Ukraine's viability as a state, and they're probably going to try to focus on that going into this winter. And that any negotiation, at least right now, as one can see it, at best, would offer Russia respite and time to mobilize its industry, reconstitute its forces. And what we'd most likely get from that is a continuation war. I mean, realistically, this is a continuation war of the original war that broke out in 2014. You know, you began this conversation talking about long wars. And it's important that folks appreciate that the, the, there are no real apparent shortcuts right now to ending this war. It is a long war, and you have to have that mentality and that commitment, right? Uh, it is true that most conventional wars tend to be either quite short or rather long. Well, this war, if you look at it properly, going back to 2014, is already principally um, a nine-year war. And if it, all the evidence we have suggests it's going to continue well into 2024. And you have to have that mindset. The big question is, well, there are some people who I think genuinely believe in Ukrainian military victory, not in the sense that you know Ukraine could completely impose its will on Russia or on Moscow, but in the sense that Ukraine could achieve its political objective by use of military power, liberate all of its territory, and at least then, uh, then discuss things from that position, right? Uh, there are others who simply, I think, believe that this offensive would give Ukraine the opportunity to negotiate from a position of strength. But I had already long taken the view in writing that this was deeply unlikely. If Ukraine was very successful, why would it negotiate? Why would it trade away the rest of its territory as it is actually liberating it? And if Ukraine wasn't particularly successful, why, why would Vladimir Putin choose to negotiate, right? The reality is these are kind of, to some extent, alibis in, in thinking through what a long war looks like. And I think it's important, I'll close on this point, that after this offensive, folks really have to ask themselves, are they genuinely committed to their strategy? Or was the strategy sort of up to the first field offensive in a prolonged conventional war? Which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but some of the conversations I've heard between here and Europe kind of seem to add up to that and make me wonder. Yeah, well, unfortunately, you may well end up measuring the timeline in terms of what I call administration time, four and eight year increments. Dara, to you, uh, on the issue of uh, tilting the battlefield is going to lead to uh, Putin's being willing to negotiate. Uh, well, I, yeah, uh, just just super briefly, I think we have to look at the evidence here. You know, as, as Mike was saying, every time there's been a major battlefield setback, whether that was up in Kiev or it was up in the northeast of Ukraine last summer, or it was the Kharkiv collapse, or it was leaving Kherson, in each one of those instances, when faced with a major battlefield setback, either caused by attrition or collapse, Putin's response and the Russian state's response was to escalate. Um, escalate with more missile strikes, escalate with annexation of four oblasts, escalate with mobilization. So if this counteroffensive succeeds, you know, the statistically, if we look at his patterns of behavior, he has escalated. Um, now, I want to, so that's that's from the strategy side of it. I can break it down operationally and say that, like, operationally trying to bifurcate the land bridge makes operational sense. Isolating Crimea makes operational sense. My question is, was that how the counteroffensive was resourced and designed? Um, and I, I, I don't know yet. I, I have to, we have to see how this turns out. And I, I have some opinions, but it's still very contingent on things. Um, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll end there um, for now.
That may that may that that redesign may have to await. And I know Mike's made this point before. The fifth phase, that is to say, preparing for the next Ukrainian counteroffensive, which uh, I know Mar uh, Mike believes this, and you may too, needs to begin sooner rather than later. One last big grand assumption question, and that concerns Putin's red lines. There is an argument again in Washington that we have blown through every putative red line um, that Putin has. And the great fears that are in the backs and fronts of everyone's mind of escalation, dramatic escalation on Putin's part. Um, does Putin have red lines? If, if the paradox of, the, of success actually would materialize, and the Russian and the Ukrainian counteroffensive would actually lead to a breakthrough and a collapse of Russian lines and the Ukrainian forces taking over, retaking the Donbass and threatening or even succeeding, well, threatening Putin's hold on Crimea. Um, so I, I typically answer that question in, in this way. Um, if that was if that was to happen, um, there is no military reason, and there never has been a, a military rationale for Russia to use nuclear weapons in this war. Um, Ukraine simply cannot damage Russia in a way that would cross their declaratory nuclear policy. They do not have that capacity to target Russian ICBMs or their space-based architecture. Like let's just you know kind of dispense with with Russia would need to use nukes from a military perspective for the survival of the state. Right. Um, it, there is the question um, about whether there is a um, political trigger for nuclear war. Um, and you know, there's not a lot of literature on that um, from the Russian side, um, you know, but I think about how this regime has responded in 18 months to um, stimuli that we previously, before the war, thought, well, that would be pretty sensitive if that happened. These things include attacking a bomber base. These things include blowing up multiple ships in the Black Sea Fleet, um, targeting the Kremlin. Um, you, know, you can just really make a bullet point list. And every time the Kremlin has downplayed it, not discussed it, um, not made a big issue of it and tried to move forward, they usually have escalated against Ukraine with more missile strikes. Um, so I just, you know, I, I think this, this notion that um, they're going to respond with a, a nuclear weapon, um, I think two things would have to be in that equation for that to happen. Um, a catastrophic collapse of the entire Russian front and a real viable political challenger to Putin, I, I don't see on the horizon, but maybe Mike has a different view. Mike, uh, concluding thought on this question? Uh, we've talked about it before, I think, Aaron. I, I see it as principally being conditions-based. Uh, I think that one shouldn't be sort of deterred by these things necessarily, that one's military stra strategy or approach shouldn't be based around uh, just risk management on the one hand. I don't quite hold the people who say that these things that we thought were red lines weren't red lines. So that means that there's no red lines at all, right? That's mm -hmm. all an unlikely proposition. I don't want to reduce things to, to the sort of um, hand-waving approach. But I think part of the challenge is also that uh, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to uh, Russian political leadership and it's going to come down to Vladimir Putin. He himself may not know what red lines are and what he's willing to do and what he's not. But consistently, we've seen, uh, I think, a much more cautious approach, and it's clear that a lot of the thinking throughout this war about what might lead to escalation, and, and those are the things that sort of induce restraint, was probably mistaken, right? And we've completely, over time, time again, we've been able to introduce capabilities, do things that people worried were escalatory, and, and they proved not to be. And so I, I'm a person who always follows the evidence, right? Right. Uh, and so the evidentiary approach suggests that there was too much of an abundance of caution, too much emphasis on this maybe uh, during this war. Yeah. Well, we've exceeded the 45 minutes. I wish we had more time. I, I must say the two of you, uh, it, it's an honor to have you as colleagues and uh, the rest of the world's going to benefit as well because your authority, your expertise, your capacity to make what is complicated, not simple, 
but understandable is really very impressive. So I want to thank both of you for an outstanding 45 minutes. And to those listeners, viewers, fans of Carnegie Connects, stay tuned. October will probably bring the Carnegie Connect with a former Israeli Supreme Court justice talking about um, the judicial overhaul and um, what we should expect in the next couple months. Um, so uh, until next time, thanks again. Dara, Mike, uh, thank you as well. And uh, until next time, take care. Thanks, Aaron.